Hello everybody, this is Dr. Anna and um, I am your geology professor in historical geology and uh, our topic today is the geologic time. This is your first chapter in this class and um, I will post these presentations in segments on YouTube and I will give you the link so listen up. I will go through all the slides and point out what is important and also the interesting facts which you could know for remember extra credit. Every test you can write extra credit. So whatever you learn but I didn't ask remember is extra credit. You have to write it down though and it has to be fact. Things which I didn't ask. So let's start with the early concepts about uh, geologic time and the age of the earth. The first person we have to talk about is James Usher. James Usher uh, lived between 1580 and 1655 uh, and he was one of the greatest scholar of his time, also a very famous theologist. What is even more interesting that not only that he was a theologist and a scholar, he also knew a bunch of languages. He was a very famous linguist and so therefore he could read the biblical texts in their original languages and through his studies, he began slowly to assemble the chronology of events and um, he basically made up the genealogy of the Bible and therefore he could pinpoint the time when earth was created by God and the time or the exact time when he said earth was created was October the 23rd, it was a Sunday afternoon, uh, 4004 BC. He wrote this in the Annals of the World, 1658, he pu published it. Now as he published this book and he wrote notes in, in, the, in the side of his Bible, these dates uh, went into the next print of the Bible, so people actually took it as, as for sure they didn't even question uh, what happened when and how old is the earth. They took it as it was uh, 4000, uh, it was created 4004 BC, so remember this date, it's important. Uh, he also calculated a couple of other important events uh, in the Bible. Um, the one which is to me very interesting is that he, he calculated that Adam and Eve has been uh, driven from the paradise on Monday, November the 10th, 4004 BC. So if you think about it and you calculate it, it seems like that they only spent 14 days in paradise, which is really not that much. So Eve ate the apple really, really quickly. And the ark, you know, after the big flood, the, the ark have touched down on Mount Ararat, which is like a very high mountain in Turkey, uh, on May 5th, 1491 BC, on a Wednesday. Um, which means it's 4,004 minus 4, so the earth was about 2,600 um, years since creation when the big flood came around. Of course these things went into, uh, oh this here is just a, this slide here just shows you uh, a, a low part of his calculation. Uh, this whole thing, this become church doctrine uh, and they gave sweeping biblical explanation for most questions about biological diversity for the longest time. So basically it shut down people's mind. Uh, they were told that every answer is in the Bible. Uh, I mean, if they have any question, the answers are always in the Bible. But the two main thing was that the creation, and that was the idea uh, that all creatures have been created independently of one another by God and uh, God organized the living things into a hierarchy with, with uh, humans being on top of the, of the hierarchy just beneath God. Uh, this is very dangerous if you think about it because this, this empowers us that we are better than anything else and we can make decisions over other things just because we are better than anybody else. Uh, the other very important thing which happened is that the, the, because of the 6,000 year of creation, uh, people didn't even dare to think about if Earth could be possibly older than 6,000 years. And if they did, actually what happened, if they were females, they were burned like, like witches usually, 
And if they were male, like Galileo or Galilei, you know, they, uh, they were in house arrest for the rest of life and rest of their life, and they couldn't publish or couldn't do anything else anymore. So these are really important facts. Uh, it, it had to be somebody really, really, really um, brave to be able to say it differently. Uh, we have to learn a couple of these people um, who dare to say differently so you would know. The first one you have to know about is is um, George Buffon. George Buffon, uh, that he, he was living between 1707 and 1788, so 18th century. And uh, what he used to try to figure out how old the Earth is, is an iron ball. He realized that Earth must have been molten at one time. And uh, so he used the iron ball, he melted it, and he cooled it down really slowly calculated the time and then related it to the size of the earth and calculated the age like that and based on his calculation he come up with 75,000 years for the age of the earth and you know it's not very good calculation but at least it's more than 6,000 years The next one you will have to know about is John Jolly. John Jolly lived much later. Uh, he, he lived between 1857 to 1933, and he calculated the age of the Earth um, using the salt content in the ocean. He assumed that ocean at the beginning was fresh water and became salty by the erosion of the rocks. Using the, the you know, if you just sit, along the river and you look at how fast the rocks erosion happening, you know that it goes really, really slow. So he calculated the erosion rate and based on his calculation of erosion rate, he also calculated how long did it take for the salt to get into the ocean. Basically, really, we're talking about sodium and chloride ions uh, when there was erosion. And he come up with 90 million years old. His calculation is much longer than, than the 6,000 or even the, the other calculations. However, it's still very young because he didn't think of the recycling of the salt. You know, there are a lot of salt mine on Earth, which means that the salt precipitated out from the ocean. So new salt had to go in to replace the, the salt which, which precipitated. So therefore, because of the recycling, there was much more time involved than just one time the, the salt content forms in the ocean. The next person we have to talk about is Nicolas Tino. And uh, Nicolas Tino was very, very important in terms of historical geology. Uh, what he did actually, he lived between 1638 and 1686. He worked on formations of rock layers and, and um, and also he formed some fossils. Uh, and the fossils were very, these, the observation he made were very, very crucial to the development of modern geology. He actually uh, stated uh, some geologic principles, which he's still using. And I'm just telling you that the geologic principle, we have eight of them. And as we go through here, the material, we're gonna mention them all. Uh, and I will ask that on the test. Um, the first test and the midterm, so you will really have to know them. So the principles he come up with are still used, as I said, and I have a slide with Steno's principles, and this is the superposition, the original horizontality, and the lateral continuity. And I will go through the principles at one place, one by one, so just hold on to it until then. The next person we have to talk about is George Cuvier. And George Cuvier uh, lived between 1769 and 1832. As I said, you do not have to know these dates, so don't worry about it. Uh, he is the one who founded vertebrate paleontology as a scientific discipline. He did find a lot of fossils, and, and it was very hard for him to understand what's happening because he was very, very Christian, so he believed that God created everything at the same time, and um, nothing has changed. So he couldn't really explain the presence of fossils in the rocks. 
So what he, he come up with, the so-called catastrophism, what he come up with, he said that wherever there are fossils, something happens, some, something unexplainable, a catastrophe, which we, sh we won't understand, so we shouldn't even question it. So this is the catastrophe, and this is his idea of the, of the formation and the age of the earth. So he said that we shouldn't ask any questions because we wouldn't be able to figure it out anyways. So he's the one who established the idea of, of uh, catastrophism which means that these revolutions or, or, the, or the presence of the fossils are unexplainable. So we, we shouldn't even think about it. The next person we have to talk about is, is uh, James Hutton. And James Hutton is one of the most person uh, in the history of historical geology. It's funny. So we therefore we call him the father of historical geology. He lived between 1726 and 1797. And he came up with one of the most important geologic principles. Uh, that's the principle of uniformity uniformitarianism. It's a very hard word to say, so just practice it. Principle of uniformitarianism. Principle of uniformitarianism. I make mistakes too. So principle of uniformitarianism. The first one he come up with is the cross-cutting relationship. The other one, the principle of inclusions. And again, the principle of uniformitarianism. It's very simple. I, I will tell you in a minute what it is. I actually believe that it's the next slide because this is so important that I actually take it out. Uh, so the principle of uh, uniformitarianism is talking about the present being the key for the past. So the present is the key for the past. And uh, if, if you think about your own history, your own history, uh, and you think about your uh, great-great-grandmother you didn't know, what do you think? What did she do first thing in the morning? Your great, great, great grandmother. Yeah, she was sleeping. She woke up. The first thing she did, she went to pee. Everybody does, like just about. After that, you wash your teeth. I don't know if they had a uh, toothbrush and toothpaste, but most likely they did something with their teeth. And then, uh, of course, she dressed, and then she had breakfast and so on. So how do we know it? We know it because, because we do it too. They had kids the same way we do. They might have had sex differently, but they definitely did it because that's why we are here. So the the um, uniformitarianism is basically telling us that the only way we can know about the past if we look at the the present. Whatever happening today has happened uh, before and will happen again. So the present really explains the past and more or less the future. People will do the exact same thing as we do. And so therefore the, the rocks too. Like if you see ripple marks, you know why is ripple mark there? Why is it there? Because there is some kind of current, either water or, or wind, but we know that there had to be a current. And um, if you see uh, ripples forming today, that's just exactly the way they form. So therefore we know that that's how they formed in the past. So this, this is a revelation in, in terms of geology. He basically come up with the way uh, every question can be answered, and that is the beauty of science. You know, science is very logical, and if you just know uh, the basic principles, you can answer any question you might have. So it's very, very important that you know uh, the uniformitarianism. And now we're going to go through the geologic time. And I have already mentioned to you that Earth, in, if not now, physical geology, that Earth is 4.5, 4.6 billion years old. Um, and, of course, none of us have any idea of what does that mean. You know, we also call this the deep time. What does it mean? How much is a million? I mean, we live about 80 years, if we are lucky, or 90. Today people live to be 90. Um, so we don't really understand 4.6 billion. I have had a very good example when I started in high school. I went to a special high school, in uh, a geology high school. 
Um, but I guess I have to stop here because 15 minutes is what the, what the YouTube takes. So here we are. I will continue it in the next segment.